Mass Effect is a game trilogy that I picked up at a very strange time in my life. I didn't have a good sense of self, and I wanted to go somewhere else for a little while. And in Mass Effect, I found an incredibly fresh sci-fi video game with deep lore, a real sense of scale, and an incredibly well-written and totally endearing cast of characters. And each successive release in the trilogy provided something awe-inspiring and new to experience, but also something safe and familiar to fall into. But sometimes, when you go somewhere else for a little while, it changes you puts you back different. And while I was lost in the vast expanse of the Milky Way, the game started to push me, to poke at me. And then suddenly and seemingly without warning, Mass Effect asked me, when do we get to stop reacting to our parents, alive or dead, and start living life for ourselves? If the body and the mind are the same thing, how come it doesn't feel that way? What does it do to you when you feel in your bones that your people have no future? And how will you face it when your time finally comes? How will you say goodbye to the people you love? And what kind of person will you be when our own collective extinction finally comes for us? Will you be able to fight or to access hope? And in that struggle for survival, should honor matter given the stakes? Could you stand to hear your lover breathlessly wish for more time? Could you turn your back on her for a cause as she asks you, please, please don't leave me? Something strange is going on with Mass Effect. In 2003, Bioware Studios, a relatively small game development company, fresh off the coattails of some big hits, started thinking about developing another IP. Writers Mac Walters and Drew Karpishan, along with project lead Casey Hudson, wanted to make a game that enabled the player to explore a vast galaxy while embroiled in a larger-than-life plot, a space opera. And they wanted to turn this game into a trilogy, wherein player choices would carry over from one game to the next. At the time, a brand new and incredibly ambitious concept. Instead of adhering to current sci-fi trends, they wanted to build the game's feel and aesthetic from a time in sci-fi before cyberpunk, drawing inspiration from Sid Mead, They're the same picture. Both film versions of Solaris, Star Trek, and most certainly lifting heavily from plot elements in Fred Pohl's early work. And thus, Mass Effect was born. And it was weird. The premise is that hundreds of years in the future, humanity has joined the galactic community of alien races, which is governed by a UN-like council. But humans are new to the scene, they have no real power, and they're perceived as overly ambitious. You play as Commander Shepard, either male or female depending on your choice, and you're promoted to be the first human specter, which is an above-the-law agent for the Council. Currently, the first Mass Effect game is going through a bit of a cultural reappraisal, and I am here for it. Because Mass Effect 1 is undeniably the strangest and most uncanny entry in the series. Everything about it feels kind of off but in an extremely compelling way. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of the works of David Lynch, who uses different aesthetic choices that clash in subtle ways to give audiences a feeling of discomfort that's also really engrossing. Lynch will use obvious sound stages with high walls and set dressing that looks empty, a pervasive ambient audio track of a low rumbling or howling wind, and then he'll tell his actors to wildly overact one moment and then underact the next. The music is often heightened to where it's just a little out of place. And your first time watching a Lynch film or show, you're like, is this bad? Is this good? Is this bad on purpose or not? I feel uncomfortable and I can't quite put my finger on exactly why. Mass Effect 1 will absolutely do this to you. It gives off a vibe that is in and of itself kind of inscrutable. First of all, even at the time of its release in 2007, its approach to third-person shooter mechanics felt particularly strange. You could take cover, but it wasn't really a cover shooter. You had the sci-fi version of magic spells to cast and an array of weapons, but neither felt very impactful. Moving your character felt like swimming underwater. These elements would later be improved in the Legendary Edition released about two years ago, but even in that version, the controls still remain a little off, much to its benefit. And as I previously mentioned, its aesthetic was a huge departure from the sci-fi norm. And similar to Lynch, many of the game's interior environments had architecture that felt sparse and disproportionate. You'll often find yourself in a mostly empty room with walls that are too high, talking with someone who apparently lives there? Faces weren't especially expressive either, a limitation of the budget and the technology at the time. So the marionette effect, common in a lot of video games, was particularly noticeable. 
Just these aspects alone make the whole game feel aesthetically sterile and cold, even during warmer character moments. Imagine every moment in a story, dramatic, intimate, or otherwise, sounding like this. So right off the bat, Mass Effect 1 feels weird, and then it doubles down. Like with haunting musical pieces that use minor tonality and dissonance to convey a sense of dread and foreboding when it just doesn't make any narrative sense to feel those things. And the incredibly off-kilter pacing, especially in the game's beginning hours, the unevenness of which manages to hook you rather than repel you. It's at once jarring, janky, and evocative. Mass Effect 1 balances this warm, fuzzy feeling of immersion you get when exploring the Citadel, interacting with different characters and seeing the changes to human life along with the things that have remained relatively similar, with the concept of the galaxy and by extension the universe being a dark, cold, and empty place portrayed through the ability to visit seemingly barren worlds where the most interesting thing you'll do is take in the horizon. Being on these relatively empty celestial bodies is a terrifying feeling, maybe the most terrifying one of all is Earth's very own moon. Seeing Earth in the sky, a small marble against the dark, massive backdrop of space sends chills down my spine. The empty sounds of the moon add to this ego-damaging feeling of personal insignificance in the grand scheme of the universe and by extension the greater insignificance of all we know and all we will ever know. It's a petrifying thought to recognise that there is a scale to which our actions, who we are and what we choose to do, will never matter. Facts. Mass Effect is a game that gives you this unsettling sense of enormous scale and desolation juxtaposed with tight quarters and interpersonal intrigue. And all of its disparate elements congeal into something truly uncanny, terrifying, cold, sterile, lonely, and engrossing, Mass Effect 1 feels hollow in a good way, which is just enough to keep you playing through a plot that's pretty uninspired, or so you think. As Commander Shepard, you're tasked with tracking down and apprehending Saren, a fellow Council Spectre who has gone rogue by assaulting a human colony. He's in search of an artifact from the mysterious, long-dead Prothean civilization. Think space ancient Egypt, which is the very civilization that left behind Mass Effect relays, which is what present-day species use to travel throughout the galaxy. All advanced galactic civilization is based on Prothean technology, even yours. If we hadn't discovered those Prothean ruins buried on Mars, we'd still be stuck on Earth. Your mission is to amass a diverse crew of humans and aliens to track him down. You find this Prothean artifact, it gives you an apocalyptic vision, and so you determine that Saren wants to destroy the entire galaxy for, like, no reason. It's a bit operatic. Bad guy is bad guy because bad. Wants to murder everything because, I don't know. And the good guy is a chosen one with a vision. Stop me if you've heard that before. Saren also has an evil subordinate named Benezia, and they have scenes together like this. <laughs> This human must be eliminated. And honestly, it's giving a little bit of 1990s Power Rangers. Zed! <laughs> oh, blasted woman. I'll finish him off! Give me that! I'll do it! But there are some interesting dynamics along the way, like how you find out that Saren is flying around in a spaceship that no one has ever seen before. It's massive, and people suspect it once belonged to the Reapers, a mythological alien race responsible for wiping out the Protheans 50,000 years ago. And apparently, this ship can mess with your mind? Like, Saren is somehow using it to do mind control on Benezia. People are not themselves around Saren. You come to idolize him, worship him, you would do anything for him. The key is Sovereign, his flagship. It is a dreadnought of incredible size and its power is extraordinary. The longer you stay aboard, the more Saren's will seems correct. You sit at his feet and smile as his words pour into you. Those elements are interesting, but still, for two thirds of the whole game, you're just chasing around some bad guy with a melodramatic plan and it's nothing to write home about, but there's a twist. Eventually, your chase after Saren leads you and your squad to a planet called Vermeer, and you discover a few things. For one, his ship actually seems to be able to mess with the mind of anyone who's in prolonged contact with it, a process called indoctrination, and Saren has set up a lab to study this in an attempt to protect himself 
from its effects. So it seems that the ship's ability to control minds isn't something that Saren is manipulating. You also find another Prothean artifact, completing your apocalyptic vision with a montage of images both deeply disturbing and highly contrasted with the emotional tone and sci-fi aesthetic of the rest of the game, which makes it even more unsettling. of that vision, you silently climb back up the rafters, and that's when Mass Effect chooses violence. This is when the game grabs you by the collar and growls. The video gaming community sat up and took notice, but in my opinion, those moments never quite got the analysis they deserved in the broader discourse surrounding the game. But almost everyone can agree that it's the moment that Mass Effect becomes something truly special. Let me set the scene. After ascending the rafters, a hologram of Saren's ship appears. are not Saren. Is this some sort of VI? Rudimentary creatures of blood and flesh. You touch my mind, fumbling in ignorance, incapable of understanding. You're not a VI. There is a realm of existence so far beyond your own, you cannot even imagine it. I am beyond your comprehension. I am sovereign. You're not just Saren's ship. You're an actual Reaper. Reaper, a label created by the Protheans to give voice to their destruction. In the end, what they chose to call us is irrelevant. We simply are. The Protheans vanished 50,000 years ago. You couldn't have been there. It's impossible. Your lives are measured in years and decades. You wither and die. We are eternal. Before us, you are nothing. Your extinction is inevitable. We are the end of everything. The cycle cannot be broken. Cycle? What cycle? The pattern has repeated itself more times than you can fathom. Organic civilizations rise, evolve, advance, and at the apex of their glory, they are extinguished. Your civilization is based on the technology of the mass relays. Our technology. By using it, your society develops so all the paths we desire. We're harvesting us. We impose order on the chaos of organic evolution. You exist because we allow it. And you will end because we demand it. What do you want? Slaves? Resources? My kind transcends your very understanding. We are each a nation, independent, free of all weakness. You cannot even grasp the nature of our existence. We have no beginning. We have no end. We are infinite. The time of our return is coming. Our numbers will darken the sky of every world. You cannot escape your doom. Two. The ship is alive! It's a member of an ancient race that has no beginning or end. One whose existence is a truth that cannot fit inside the gray matter that fills our skulls. God is real and we are his chattel. Quasi-mechanical cuttlefish deities have come to kill us because they behave and operate on a plane of existence and consciousness that makes the human experience of sentience look like simple addition on a calculator by comparison. In my opinion, this is more Lovecraft than Lovecraft. Even Cthulhu's motivations were somewhat clear because he still wanted worshippers and slaves because it was all some goofy xenophobic metaphor for reverse imperialism or whatever. But the Reapers? Now the Reapers, they're simply a force, a truth, an element. Life forms that are so advanced and infinite that they transcend notions of morality. Morality being a human concept bereft of the complexity that comprises a single thought from the mind of a Reaper.
Listen, the ocean doesn't drown us because it wants to be cruel. It's simply the ocean. And the reapers don't do as they do because they're evil. They're just a force, a fact of nature, not just a noun, but a verb. And as such, they are a perfect representation of a trauma that exists so deep within humanity. And each and every one of us as individual people, me, you watching this video, that it's often glossed over whenever the Mass Effect trilogy is discussed. And in my opinion, it's the most important aspect of Mass Effect's legacy. I've seen enough cast and crew interviews to know that if you ask the Mass Effect writing team or cast of voice actors or any member of the devoted fan base, why the series was so impactful, they'll likely tell you that it's because of the great characters, or the unprecedented continuity of player choice, and they wouldn't be wrong. But although all of those elements were brilliant landmarks in the art of video games, and elevate the trilogy as an important cultural artifact, I remain convinced that Mass Effect's literary value lies elsewhere, unspoken and unacknowledged, as if nestled in the edges of dark space like the Reapers themselves. It's a deeply uncomfortable literary theme that only ever receives tangential, tacit nods in its direction. One that doesn't come into full relief until the third game, but still courses through the entire trilogy. And it begins here, with our conversation with Sovereign. Mass Effect is a game trilogy about death. It's about death. Chapter 3. We are sex bubbles and we're here to make you think about death and get sad and stuff! Death is not an unusual presence in video games. On the contrary, it's often part of the core game mechanic. But the Mass Effect trilogy isn't content to simply feature death as a function of gameplay or as a dramatic tool within its storytelling, though it does do both of those things. Mass Effect is unique because it examines mortality from so many different angles and a multitude of scales. Plenty of video games have contemplated death, but more often than not, the focus is narrower, honing in on a single story or aspect of death to form its examination. Like a story about a dying parent or a grieving spouse. There are, of course, exceptions to this, like the brilliant What Remains of Edith Finch. And not only is Mass Effect one of those exceptions, but it's a big budget AAA series meant for a broad audience. A really unusual vehicle for mature ruminations on mortality, hope, and the nature of existence. As the trilogy goes on, Mass Effect spends significant time examining terminal illness, grief, the loss of life partners, being responsible for the deaths and lies of others, self-sacrifice, unaliving, genocide, diaspora, war, and collective extinction. And each of these subjects gets a deep dive. However, in Mass Effect 1 and 2, death is mostly examined through the lens of player choice. Keyword mostly. Just one of many examples is that late in the first game, the player character Shepard has to choose between the lives of two of their squadmates, sacrificing one to save the day. Whoever you choose to keep alive will be a major character for the rest of the trilogy, and from a gameplay perspective, that was pretty groundbreaking. And so the choice is a difficult one to make from a gameplay standpoint, but it's not emotionally difficult. I'm generalizing here, but the consensus among players is that on the one hand, you have Ashley, who's a huge xenophobe. I can't tell the aliens from the animals. Oh, you are such a racist. And on the other hand, you have Caden, who has the personality of wet cardboard, despite both characters being very well voice acted. There are tons of other examples like this, where Mass Effect uses death as a nexus for player choice, with impact that spans across all three games, which allows death to have as much permanence as it can in interactive fiction, and permanence is kind of the thing about death. It's a brilliant move, but it's only when Mass Effect reveals its twist. You cannot even grasp the nature of our existence. It's only then that Mass Effect's ambitions with the subject of mortality becomes clear. I mean, it's in the name. Sovereign is a Reaper, and he is mighty grim. I don't think that the Reapers are meant to be an exact stand-in for or personification of death, at least not all the time. They're more of a plot device that allows them to embody the nature of mortality whenever the plot calls for it. And they fit the bill. Like the Reapers as they're first presented to us by Sovereign, death is enormous and incomprehensible, even as we stare it right in the face. It's also inevitable. Death has no discernible motivation, and it's infinite. It has no beginning or end, and it's beyond our understanding. It doesn't come for us to be cruel or merciful. It comes for us because that's just what it does. It doesn't care about us enough to love or hate us. It doesn't care if we want more time. And I think because this is such a difficult subject for us as human beings, it can fly under the radar of critical analysis. 
And I'll argue that because Bioware itself didn't fully understand what they had tapped into, it's what ultimately led Mass Effect to contradict itself multiple times, trip over its own feet, and deliver one of the most infamous endings in video game history. Because the difficult truth is that the Mass Effect trilogy is brilliant art in spite of itself. Each game will frequently do something inventive and captivating, and then later make an artistic choice that undercuts it, which I don't think can be entirely explained by a rushed development schedule or the fumblings of any one project leader or head writer. I truly believe Bioware didn't seem to understand what it was that made its own work of art so great, so impactful, and popular. I deeply love this series of games, but it is incredibly flawed. And those flaws and those moments of artistic self-sabotage due to a seeming lack of self-awareness creates a real palpable tension for the player. But there's an argument to be made that this uncomfortable tension sometimes kind of works. Its thematic inconsistencies will sometimes reflect the larger message of the trilogy. Because Mass Effect is about the mess of discovering your soul, your limits, and the meaning you graft onto existence against the backdrop of imminent death, possible extinction, and violent conflict. And that's what we're all doing as human beings, to various degrees, right now, in real life. And in that process, we are messy and contradictory and hypocritical and inconsistent, like the game itself. So we're gonna talk about it, <laughs> about why you should play this game trilogy, about why it hurt you so much if you already have, and about how the deeper aspects to a work of art can elude even the artist and why you should care. Also, I've got a hot take on the ending, you know? So that's like a juicy little carrot at the end of the video. You know, just like a little carrot. So I'm playing the Mass Effect trilogy on Xbox 360. Super old, look at it, it's ancient. Okay, I'm on the third one and every time- So when I got the idea to do this video, I knew I was gonna have to replay the trilogy. I dusted off my old Xbox 360 I've been keeping in the basement and, and I went to it. I'd already played the trilogy a few times before when it came out and with each playthrough, its emotional impact on me started to, to lessen. This time I was expecting a fun trip down memory lane, but nothing that was gonna hit me. But it hit me. And when I was done, I decided to buy the Legendary Edition and play through it all again on my PS4. I said before that Mass Effect helped me process things during a bad time in my life. So somewhere in the middle of these two playthroughs, I started to ask myself, uh, am I in a bad place again? Chapter 4. Mass Effect 2, Electric Boogaloo. By 2007, Bioware had already started production on Mass Effect 2. The creative leads wanted the next game to function as the Empire Strikes Back of the series, something darker, seedier, and edgy. And that tone and feel is immediately apparent after picking up the game. The action is snappier, the lighting and art design reflect a dark, punky aesthetic, and your early introduction into the floating city of Omega immediately gives you the sense that while Mass Effect 1 reflected the sleek 70s, Mass Effect 2 was drawing more from the cyberpunk 80s. In Mass Effect 2, the Galactic Council still refuses to take the Reaper threat seriously or even acknowledge the Reaper's existence despite having been literally assaulted by one in the end of the last game. Ah yes, Reapers. Uh, we have dismissed that claim. And that's not bad writing, that's done on purpose, but we'll get to that later. So for now, Commander Shepard joins forces with the clandestine group Cerberus, led by the enigmatic figure known as the Elusive Man, in order to stop the Reaper's preparations for invasion. Casey Hudson and the Mass Effect team wanted to structure Mass Effect 2 a little differently, more like a heist film, so that your main quest in the game is to gather a large crew of people to carry out a final mission that you can initiate at your leisure. That structure provides two benefits. First, the plot isn't encumbered by a ticking clock, so it's not narratively dissonant to go off and do some side quests instead of the main quest. Narratively speaking, you're supposed to be taking your time. Second, it enables Mass Effect 2 to focus on contained stories that hone in on the character arcs of your crewmates, which is awesome because that character work is great. It's the reason why it's often cited by critics and fans as the best in the series. More relevant to the point, Mass Effect 2 takes the series' examination of mortality more seriously than its predecessor. Like the first Mass Effect, it also incorporates narrative mechanics around death, 
In the final mission, death can befall any of your squad mates should you make the wrong call or be unprepared, and that will have a lasting impact into the next game. But what I find more interesting is that most of the playable squad mates that you collect for the final mission have character arcs that are defined by their relationship to mortality. It's more than death being used as a plot device to propel the story, it's death being used as a way to define the depth of the characters, not just once, but over and over again. Now that's a theme. Mass Effect 2 introduces Thane Krios to the crew. Thane is an assassin who is reevaluating the morality of his actions now that he faces a slow but certain death, a bacterial lung disease called Keprel Syndrome. He's also a Drell who's steeped in his culture's religious traditions, more so than others of his kind. But his faith is also what led him to eschew the morality of his actions as a killer, actions that also led to his wife's death and the alienation of his son. As a result, he struggles not just with dying, but his past. Thane's story is about how engaging with your own mortality will prompt introspection that we otherwise refuse ourselves because we assume we'll have more time. Mass Effect 2 also reunites us with Tali Zora Vasnila, a fan favorite squadmate from the first game. Tali is a Quarian, another alien race in the Mass Effect universe living in Diaspora for the past 300 years. The Quarians now live as galactic nomads on a fleet of ships, forced to wear specialized suits at all times because of their delicate biology when outside their original planet. When we first meet Tali in Mass Effect 1, she's a young woman on a pilgrimage from her fleet who stumbles on information about Saren's plans, and so she joins her crew. In Mass Effect 2, she's completed her pilgrimage and is working for the Quarian leadership. Some time after rejoining your crew, she's called back to the Quarian fleet to stand trial for treason. Regardless of how the trial resolves, it becomes clear that her father, a high-ranking admiral, has endangered her people and caused the deaths of hundreds, all in a desperate bid to develop technology to help retake the Quarian homeworld. And that's when Tally finds her father's body. No, 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 no. You always had a plan. Masked life signs or, or an onboard medical stasis program, maybe. You, you wouldn't. They're wrong. You wouldn't just die like this. You wouldn't leave me to clean up your mess. You can't. He was trying to help you, Tally. The only way he knew how. He didn't want to leave you. Of course he did. Every time he went off to battle, every time he sent me away, it was all about what he wanted. I wanted a father who would take the sick leave time and let me see his face without a helmet in the way. Instead, I got orders. And this, and a panel of admirals who think I'm a traitor, those were my father's gifts to me. We'll get into how death really defines Tally's character and her people later, but for now there's also Samara, an Asari warrior poet who's on a quest to kill her own daughter, Morinth, who is herself a serial killer. Kasumi is a world-class thief grieving the death of her partner and the love of her life. And Morden is a Salarian who insists that he has absolutely no regrets or feelings of guilt in his role as a scientist who helped perpetuate a bioweapon that mass sterilized an entire species, most likely dooming them to extinction. More on him later as well. Finally, there's Garrus, another character that returns from the first game. He spent the last few years as a vigilante and feels personally responsible for getting his squad killed. His character arc and entire side story revolves around the guilt in being responsible for the deaths of others. It's the same guilt that drives him to seek revenge through more killing. It's also the same guilt that leaves Garrus's revenge target a hollow shell of a man. In these stories, death and mortality is the object through which characters define themselves, whether through grief, responsibility, redemption, or even a way of life. And while Mass Effect 2 provides us with more information about the trilogy's main antagonists, the Reapers still remain in the shadows. They haven't invaded yet, and they're just making preparations by proxy. That marked absence adds to the sense of mystery and foreboding surrounding them, building tension. When your crew discovers the ancient corpse of a Reaper, you board it to find out what happened to the team of scientists that have been studying it from the inside. That's when Mass Effect 2 takes particular care to reaffirm the Reaper's Lovecraftian, godlike status. A series of logs show the crew becoming slowly indoctrinated by their proximity to the Reaper corpse, remembering huge life details incorrectly, getting headaches, and just generally acting strange. The log entries culminate with the chilling ramblings of someone in late stage indoctrination. Jandana said the ship was dead. We trusted him. He was right. But even a dead god can dream. A god 
A real god is a verb, not some old man with magic powers. It's a force. It warps reality just by being there. It doesn't have to want to. It doesn't have to think about it. It just does. That's what Chandana didn't get. Not until it was too late. The, the god's mind is gone, but it still dreams. He knows now. He's tuned in on our dream. If I close my eyes, I can feel him. I can feel every one of us. Chapter 5. The Reapers have arrived. We are so f Mass Effect 3 wastes absolutely no time getting started. Commander Shepard is called in by human leadership to be informed that they're getting reports of strange ships landing across Earth, concentrating in London. Reapers are here indeed. I've heard other critics knock the opening of the game for its sound design, and I have to say, hard disagree. Listen to the Reapers. They chirp and whirr. Why? Is that how they communicate with each other? Is their presence warping the air pressure and therefore the sound around us? It's so distinctly alien and terrifying. And of course, there's the sound that they're most known for. It's a low, slowed down sort of brass sound, which I think is perfect because of the rich tradition of associating trumpets with the sound of the apocalypse. The angels of death have arrived. Their scale is of course massive and was technologically very impressive in 2013. And that scale is in line with Sovereign's promise that our numbers will darken the sky of every world. I can't stress enough how well Mass Effect 3's introductory sequence instills a sense of megalophobia and cosmic foreboding. And it's incredibly crucial in understanding Mass Effect 3, even the entire trilogy, because it clearly lays out its central message. After Admiral Anderson pulls Shepard out of the rubble, they begin talking about the war that will unfold before them now that the Reapers have arrived. Every minute these machines are here, thousands of innocent people die. It's hard enough fighting a war, but it's worth knowing no matter how hard you try. You can't save them all. While mortality is arguably the most prominent and overlooked central theme in the Mass Effect trilogy, this is the often overlooked central message. War is hell, and you can't save them all. Much criticism of the prologue is also directed at the introduction of a small boy that Shepard is unable to coax out of hiding. As they later take off in the Normandy, leaving Admiral Anderson behind to coordinate the fight on the ground, the boy is killed by a Reaper blast. I understand some criticism here. I too am not a fan of using children as a cheat code in fiction for getting people to care. But I think this does effectively support the message that Mass Effect has literally just said out loud. You can't save them all. It helps build Shepard's character, something that is noticeably absent in the previous two games. Shepard cares about Earth and the innocent children on it, and they will spend the rest of the game wrestling with the deaths that they can't prevent, wrestling with their failures. I'd argue the point isn't to feel devastated by the child who couldn't escape, but rather to feel devastated by seeing our player character, someone who's been almost completely unwavering in the past two games, genuinely struggle. For the first time in the trilogy, Shepard has nightmares. They open up emotionally to their crew for the first time. When the Reapers hit, I could hear people screaming in the streets below me. We left a lot of them behind. There's no way for you to save them all. They use humor as a salve for the first time. You know, I think it might be time to test the fire alarm. I'll pay you a million credits not to do that, sir. Two million, and we have a deal. I hate you. I hate you... Sir. As you were, Williams. And they absolutely lose their cool for the first time. In case you hadn't noticed, we just lost a few million people. This isn't the time! Shepard, again, for the first time, is wrestling with... Well, death. After departing Earth, the crew of the Normandy follow a lead to Mars, where Liara Tassoni has uncovered something vital in the Prothean archives that are stored there. Plans for something called the Crucible, a superweapon capable of destroying the Reapers. But Cerberus forces are already there, causing havoc and planning to steal the data for themselves. Priority Mars is our first proper mission in the game, and it approaches the issue of mortality from two major angles. First, it introduces us to Cerberus' role in the story and the elusive man's driving motivation. 
Instead of defeating or destroying the Reapers, he seeks to control them. If we're reading the Reapers as an intermittent personification of death, then the elusive man's goal here is almost gothic. He seeks to control death itself. It is literally the Dr. Frankenstein approach, and we see this reflected in how the elusive man has implanted Cerber soldiers and even himself with Reaper technology. Begin the procedure. No anesthetic. The Frankenstein vibes are very apparent, and the elusive man pursues this goal of mastering life and death at great risk and expense for the rest of humanity. An added layer to this is that the elusive man is the proverbial billionaire capitalist of the series. He embodies the ambitions of ultra-wealthy private individuals to not just reach for the stars, but to find ways to ultimately control fate, aging, and death through technological means that carry enormous risks for the rest of us. His goal here isn't survival, it's immortality, the limitless power that comes with controlling death itself. <laughs> After he remotely copies the data from the archive, you engage in a chase that leaves the Vermeer survivor, either Caden or Ashley, in critical condition. This is the second way that Priority Mars sets up one of Mass Effect's more grueling interfaces with death. Ashley needs medical attention. We have to leave the Soul System. I know. The Citadel is our best chance. We can find help there. Get us to the Citadel, Joker. Roger that. Hold on, Ash. And that's how we are introduced to the Huerta Memorial Hospital. It is now a key location on the Citadel, a central location in all three games, but this marks the first time in the series wherein we visit a hospital at all. Most importantly, it's a location that the player will visit over and over and over and over. Not just to check up on Caden or Ashley, but to meet with other characters and complete side tasks. Over the course of those visits, the Vermeer survivor will slowly recover from their injuries, but you'll also be treated to the various stories of the patients and staff reverberating through the halls. A wounded man is told by his doctor that they have to amputate his leg. I... I... I don't understand. It, it doesn't even hurt. And Asari, struggling with PTSD, reluctantly relives her trauma with her therapist, all the while begging for a gun so that she can feel safe. In my first playthrough, I requisitioned one to her, thinking that it would give her some safety and comfort. She used it to end her life. And as you progress further into the game, the intensifying war is felt and reflected in the hospital, with a steadily increasing number of refugees populating the level. Huerta Memorial eventually becomes overrun with the sick, injured, and dying. Supplies are low, and the staff are panicked and spread thin. Two doctors discuss how to prioritize lives with what little supplies they have. The ambient noise in the hospital is now filled with pained sounds and crying. It is most likely where you will watch your old friend Thane Krios die. His last moments are slow and painful as he struggles to breathe. In these final moments, his son asks you to recite a prayer. You stand there, awkwardly reading from an alien Bible, watching as someone who was once a vibrant hero quiver and fade into nothingness. Goodbye, Thane. You won't be alone long. The Lower Docks is another key location in the Citadel, one that the player will visit just as frequently, and it contains a memorial wall for the fallen, as well as makeshift housing for refugees. People everywhere are lost and scattered. A teenage girl waits for her parents' ship to arrive, but they never come. A man begs you to euthanize him so he doesn't have to languish in pain with the knowledge that his species has already been nearly wiped out. Just as with the hospital, over time the docks become more crowded and desperate, and the memorial wall overflows with pictures of the fallen. It's a wall that you will visit multiple times to support different crew members suffering through loss and grief. Your shuttle pilot Cortez mourns the sudden death of his husband, and Ashley supports her sister through the loss of hers. After each mission in the game, both major and minor, you will find your crew rotating through various areas in the ship, sometimes in conversation with other crew members, and often with something unique to say about the events of the previous mission. It's one of the best aspects of Mass Effect 3 because it allows Bioware to highlight the different and complex relationships between your squad mates and crew, as well as develop their characters outside of major story beats or intense action. As a result, the Normandy truly feels like a lived space, and you become invested in characters that you maybe wouldn't have otherwise, as you'll see them talking to each other from time to time, forming bonds. But it's important to note that every single time you head down to the crew deck to talk to your favorite characters, the elevator doors open and leave you facing the Normandy's own memorial wall. And the names on that wall are not static. 
Mass Effect 3 is not content to let you forget about death, nor the existence and suffering of refugees. And all this environmental storytelling ruminating on the toll of war underscores the smaller conflicts that Bioware has written into the characters. For instance, Garrus, who spent the first two games rejecting bureaucracy and regulation with regards to justice, becoming more and more of a vigilante over time, now finds himself in an official leadership position. I told you once that I wasn't a very good Turian, Shepard. I never could follow bad orders. Now I'm the one giving the orders. When the plot has Talizora rejoining your crew, she too struggles with the same burden of responsibility. 17 million lives are riding on me, and I don't know if I can save them. There's also Primarch Victus, his son, Cal Rieger, all people who openly wrestle with the burden of responsibility for other people's lives. The comfort Shepard can provide these characters is more dramatically effective because Bioware takes steps to show how Shepard themselves also shares the struggle. Because ED says that according to your armor's metabolic scans, you're under more stress now than during the Skillian Blitz. Like, more than a coup's, where Thresher Maws ate the rest of your squad. And the last time I had a briefing with Anderson, he told me to take care of you. I don't know if I can do this, Tally. Earth, Palavin, Thessia. Not to mention their recurring nightmares of the boy who represents their anguish over the fact that you can't save them all. After all, that is the fundamental and inevitable cruelty of death. You can't always stop it. These smaller character conflicts, along with the game reinforcing constant engagement with environments that react to death, provide the thematic latticework for Bioware to plot out its story. In Mass Effect 3, the player will have to complete three major plot arcs. In the first two, Shepard will have to address deep-seated conflicts between species that are centuries old. And in these stories, it's the culture and history that the characters belong to, which functions as the primary source of rumination on death and hope. The Reapers remain a supportive plot element to drive things forward. First, Commander Shepard will have to get the Krogan to support the Turians in defending their homeworld, the first step in uniting the galaxy against the Reaper threat. But there's bad blood there. Hundreds of years before humanity ever arrived on the scene, the alien council races mass sterilized the Krogan with a bioweapon called the Genophage, something that makes only one in 1,000 Krogan births viable. Their excuse? was to end a galactic war, but the Krogan live with the effects to this day. It's lore that strongly echoes the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and it explores how death weaves itself into cultural behavior, genocidal calculus, guilt, and redemption. So halfway through writing this video, I started to wonder why I felt so strange. I started to think about like how this series of games is relevant to me personally. And if there's one theme to my YouTube channel, like one like overarching motif that's present in most of my videos, is the idea that you shouldn't like get lost in doom and despair. Not just because like everything's gonna be okay if you just think positive thoughts, but because if you think nothing is ever gonna change, if you're consumed with despair, it plays right into the hands of the people who want the status quo to keep on going. You know? And then nothing ever will change. Nothing ever change that way. But just because I really believe in that, it, it doesn't mean that there aren't these times, like these moments where I think, like, are we gonna make it? <laughs> Okay, so this video is long and heavy, and I wanted to give you a little break so you could stretch your legs. Hydrate, get yourself a snack, move your body, whatever you like. We're going to continue on our journey of analyzing death, which gets a little political and then really dark. But I cap it all off with a message of hope, albeit an ominous one. So, if that sounds good to you and you'd like what you've seen so far, please regard the cosmically horrifying floating head. Very good. Don't forget to hit the bell when you subscribe. It really helps. And obviously, dude, you're not going to get spammed. It took like four months to make this video. Lastly, feel free to continue the discussion in the comments below to tell me how right I am about everything, including how Tally is the best romance option in the game. That That is an objectively factual opinion. All right, without further ado, here we go.
Rex Ernat is a hulking figure with a presence that commands attention. His scars and battle-worn armor bears testament to a lifetime of combat. The Krogan, his people, are a dying race, destined for oblivion. The Genophage had robbed them of a future, a slow death sentence disguised as a means of galactic stability. Rex made himself into a relentless force willing to shed blood for coin because he saw little reason to temper his aggression when the galaxy had already deemed his people expendable. The Genophage was rationalized as necessary to stop a war and temper the Krogan's violent nature, a view that at first seems to have some validity because of the aggression displayed among the Krogan's scattered people. But. Are the Krogan's aggressive actions really born from biology, or is it born from a bitter acceptance of their grim reality? Is it in their nature to be angry and violent, or is it defiance in the face of despair, in the face of extinction? A lot of works in the fantasy and sci-fi genre have a pretty interesting commitment to biological essentialism. At the very least, it goes back as far as Tolkien, who did a lot to popularize projecting racial and national tensions onto characters of different species. A technique that also fits really well into the sci-fi genre, which is often very interested in alien races and civilizations, and doubly so for RPGs, where race is a convenient way to add a variable in your character build. There's even a trope named after it, fantasy counterpart race. Elves are always this way, dwarves are always that way. Each might have their own individuality, but all can be easily and accurately generalized by their behavior and outlook because it's an essential aspect of their species. I am a Vulcan, my emotional state is irrelevant. Well, I'm a Ferengi, and my emotional state is very relevant. Fast forward to 2007, and you get Mass Effect. And for the first two games in the series, Mass Effect seems to be pretty committed to essentialism as well. But then it flips everything on its head and guides the results into the gaping maw of its overarching themes of death and hope. In Mass Effect 1, Ernod Rex is a squad mate, but even though he presents us with a generally sympathetic view of the Krogan and their plight, it's a view that largely supports the idea that the Krogan all share innate characteristics because of their biology. You ask a Krogan, would he rather find a cure for the genophage or fight for credits? He'll choose fighting every time. It's just who we are, Shepard. I can't change that. Nobody can. I mean, I guess it makes sense, right? They're dinosaur people. Wouldn't they act in dinosaur ways? We as humans are ape people. Surely we act in a way that's tied to our primate biology, right? Most importantly, the in-game codex, the glossary of the game, reaffirms this. The codex makes it clear that the Krogan are inherently, and I quote, brutal, primitive, and quick breeding. It also states that Krogan culture is selfish, unsympathetic, and blunt, and that most Krogan trust and serve no one but themselves. Back in the real world, literally all of these characteristics were and are used to describe racial and cultural groups to dehumanize them, which led to eugenics, which specifically said that those stereotypes were a biological fact, which was just a way to rationalize things like genocide and mass sterilization. And that's exactly what happens to the Krogan. I don't think the Krogan are meant to be a direct representation of any one specific real world group. But by playing around with stereotypes that have roots in real world racism, and asserting that these qualities are innately biological to a fictitious species, Mass Effect lulls players into accepting the premise. And in doing so, it paves the way for the trilogy to subvert it as time goes on. Basically, it's sort of steel man's eugenics so that it can tear it apart later. Your mileage may vary on that approach, but... In Mass Effect 1 on Vermeer, you discover that Saren has found some way to breed an army of Krogan for himself to aid the Reapers in their coming invasion. Therefore, perhaps Saren's lab contains the secret to curing the genophage. But you need to blow up the lab because time is of the essence and Saren needs to be stopped from ending like literally all life. Rex isn't too happy about this. He storms off in anger and fires his shotgun repeatedly into the open water. The following conversation with him can either end with you convincing him to help you to stop Saren and subsequently destroy the cure, or it can end with Rex's death, either by your hand, or crucially, if you hesitate to pull the trigger, Ashley will do it for you because she's a super big old xenophobe. It's not racism, not really. Members of their species will always be more important to them than humans are. But what's most interesting to me is how the dialogue plays out if you convince Rex to go along with the plan. Rex, these Krogan are not your people. They're slaves of Saren, tools. Is that what you want for them? No, we were tools for the council once. 
To thank us for wiping out the Rachni, they neutered us all. I doubt Saren will be as generous. Rex is a member of a race that was used for their inherent value and then punished to keep them from true self-determination. He correctly recognizes that the galaxy will happily do this again. This is not an unheard of phenomenon in the real world. This conversation is the beginning of Mass Effect asking you, hey, are you sure about this whole race essentialism thing? Maybe this narrative of an inherently violent race is a convenient one. A narrative that has become a psychological burden on an entire people who then fulfill that narrative. Because it's been ingrained for generations in the minds of everyone throughout the Milky Way, Krogan included. Game critic Evan Narcisse wrote about his experience with this scene in Mass Effect 1. In his playthrough, Rex was killed by Ashley, and as a person of color, Ashley's racism certainly wasn't lost on him. He says, I could win the game, but he wasn't coming back. Being forced to lose my in-game comrade, who I thought of as a virtual person of color and as a brother in arms, affected me in a forceful way that I never expected. Mass Effect made me look at myself and think about the way races, classes, and individuals bring their histories to bear. It's a powerful thing for any creative work to do, and Mass Effect does it exceedingly well. But Mass Effect goes on to do a bit more. Enter Morden Solus in Mass Effect 2. Morden is a beloved character and crew member in the game for a good reason. A fast-talking, hard-boiled nerd who takes his oath as a doctor and his role as a scientist to heart. He is the kind of character who reveals a softer, more humorous side over time, and everybody loves finding the gooey center of a hardened, logical exterior. You performed Gilbert and Sullivan? My Xena science studies range from urban to agrarian. I am the very model of a scientist solarian. Bottom line is, Morden's hyper rational, slightly on the spectrum vibe is deeply endearing. But He's got some skeletons in his closet. In his younger days, he was assigned to a special tasks group whose secret mission was to update the genophage virus. Uncovered surprising data. Krogan population was increasing at faster rate than expected. Krogan were adapting to genophage, overcoming disease. Personally led a science team. Geneticists, chemists, sociologists, mathematicians created new version of genophage, released it on Tuchanka, other Krogan-centric areas, re-stabilized Krogan population. In other words, Morden had become death, destroyer of worlds. And you can feel his guilt, even as he refuses to admit he did anything wrong. You never considered other options? Hundreds, thousands. Modified genophage offered best outcome. Stabilized population, avoided publicity that could incite Krogan anger, averted potential genocide or devastating war. Best solution for whole galaxy, Krogan included. What's most interesting is that he clings to the idea that this was a move that was best for the Krogan as well, and that it was the only viable option to the <clears throat> Krogan question. He also balks at the idea of eradicating the Krogan altogether. Not a war criminal, not a murderer, genocide unnecessary. Genophage modification protected galaxy, allowed Krogan chance to survive. Everyone wins, good for us, good for them. Morden is distanced from the reality of his actions, which makes it harder for him to acknowledge how bias has functioned within him. He is intellectually aware of the cost, the death, the toll, but he is ultimately removed from the scale of mortality that he is responsible for. I think this is a really good illustration of how everyday people hold biased beliefs while still understanding themselves as loving towards the groups they're biased against. I don't hate them, I just think as a whole they're different, maybe a little more violent, and that needs to be dealt with. Of course there are good apples, but it's better for them if we control their more unsavory characteristics. Krogan as a whole, violent, aggressive, still have outliers worth saving. This is literally a defining perspective in eugenics, partly because it helps soothe the cognitive dissonance. But Morden's coping mechanisms and our understanding of the narratives surrounding the Krogan and the Genophage start to crumble during his personal side mission. Morden has to contend with the reality of the death that has flowed from him. You and Morden head to the Krogan homeworld to find Malin, an old colleague of his who has been performing experiments to end the Genophage. When you arrive, you find that his experiments are actually cruel, despite having a noble goal. Dead Krogan, female. Tumors indicate experimentation. No restraint marks. Volunteer. Sterile, Werelock female, willing to risk procedures. Hoped for cure. Pointless. Pointless waste of life. I didn't expect you to be disturbed by the sight of a dead Krogan. What? Why? Because of genophage work? Irrelevant. No. 
causative. Never experimented on live Krogan, never killed with medicine, her death not my work, only reaction to it. Goal was to stabilize population. Never wanted this. Can see it logically, but still unnecessary. Foolish waste of life. Hate to see it. Modified Genophage project great in scope, scientifically brilliant, but ethically difficult. Krogan reaction visceral, tragic, not guilty, but responsible. Trained as doctor, Genophage affects fertility, doesn't kill, still caused this. Hard to see big picture behind pile of corpses. If you need this much soul searching to get over it, maybe the Genophage was wrong. Had to be done. Brachni wars, Krogan rebellions all pointed to Krogan aggression. So many simulations. Effects of Krogan population increase all pointed to war. Extinction. Genophage or genocide. Save galaxy from Krogan. Save Krogan from galaxy. So you're willing to sterilize a species based on the evidence of a few simulations? Yes. Millions of data points. Years of arguments. Countless scenarios. All noted Krogan fragmentation as dangerous. No unified culture to support repopulation. Would have been war. Turians and humans destroying Krogan utterly. Genophage was better. Saved lives. Look at the dead woman, Morton. It doesn't look like you saved her. No, it doesn't. Worked with available data. Only option. No other possible. Doesn't matter. That line. Look at the dead woman, Morton. Mass Effect uses the reality of death as a way to strip down the narratives we tell about other people and ourselves. Were all of these simulations and projections of possible outcomes colored by how the Salarians saw the Krogan? When you finally meet up with Malin and question his ethics and method of experimentation for a cure, he's got some bars. We justified this atrocity by saying the Krogan would cause havoc and war if their population recovered. But look at the galaxy. Batarian attacks in the Traverse, Geth attacks in the Citadel. Is this a more peaceful universe? Krogan fight over fertile females. They become mercenaries or pirates because they see no alternative. They would be thriving in a cultural renaissance now had we not decided that this is what they deserved. We committed cultural genocide. Nothing I do will ever be justified. The experiments are monstrous because I was taught to be a monster. Malin is telling you point blank. The narratives we create around other groups are as potent, if not more so, than biology. Maybe biological essentialism isn't the truth, because it doesn't account for social factors. While biology influences us, we are who we are because of our environment and our history. The insistence that the Krogan are cultureless and brutal is constantly being undermined by Krogan that you meet throughout the game. The Krogan on Ilium who loves poetry, the guy on the Citadel obsessed with fish, the Krogan scientist who feels he's surrounded by morons. It's also undermined by the Krogan Eve introduced in Mass Effect 3. When my child didn't draw breath, that's when my life truly began. The genophage forces us to live on hope alone. There is nothing else. There is no reason to exist other than the hope that the next day will bring change. In Mass Effect 3, when the Reapers finally invade, you find Morden working for the STG again, but this time to help find a cure for the genophage. When you ask him about why he's done such a 180, he tells you it's not for personal reasons, and still insists his earlier work on the genophage was the right thing to do at the time. But when you finally go on a mission to disperse the cure, you can find yourself having one of the most impactful exchanges in the game. In order for the cure to work, Morden has to risk his life, and Shepard doesn't want him to go. Every time we've talked about this before, you've defended the genophage. How can you change your mind now? I made a mistake! I made a mistake. Focused on big picture. Big picture made of little pictures. Too many variables. Can't hide behind statistics. Can't ignore new data. My responsibility. Need to go. Running out of time. Morden has been quietly contemplating his actions and has found himself not responsible, but guilty. No matter how you play the game, in order to cure the genophage, you have to let Morden sacrifice himself. He's willing to die to do right by others and fix his past mistakes. Unless you believe in a traditional idea of heaven, when you die for a cause, you don't get to see the results. You don't get to feel the satisfaction of witnessing the good of your actions. And you most certainly don't get to feel the satisfaction of redemption and forgiveness. Redemption is only relevant to the ego if the ego is around to feel it. And yet, he does it anyway. Right after he says his famous line. Had to be me. 
someone else might have gotten it wrong. I think the reason why that line hits so hard is because on some level, Morden is winking at you through the bullshit. It didn't have to be him because someone else would have gotten it wrong. It had to be him because it was his responsibility, because he needed to do what was right, both morally and personally. You can sabotage the genophage cure, but most playthrough conditions will require you to kill Morden to do so, and then Rex as well if he survived previous playthroughs. That really solidifies that you're killing two friends and committing genocide for a gamble on Solarian support in the war effort. And in both scenarios, cure or sabotage, Mass Effect makes a potent statement about biological essentialism and what it ultimately leads to. We internalize narratives that define and limit other people. We internalize narratives that define and limit ourselves, and then we all act accordingly. But it's also a story about our relationship with death, living in the shadow of genocide, facing a future where death is certain and likely quick, that instills a sense of nihilism in people. And that nihilism about the future of our communities and even the human race can lead to despair. It's a plight that's foisted on marginalized groups in real life every day. And in a much softer and broader sense, it's a plight I think almost anyone can relate to. In the sense that hopelessness flows like wine from seeing disaster after disaster after disaster in the news. Death is also the mode through which Morden can understand his complicity and come to terms with how his intelligence wasn't enough to make righteous decisions. He lacked perspective, something that he could only gain through seeing the mortal effects of his own actions. Morden's legacy has been defined by his relationship with life and death, healing the sick as a doctor, killing the wicked as a soldier, playing God and toying with the lives of others, and paying reparations for his actions through self-sacrifice. Just as we seek to attach meaning to life, we seek to attach meaning to its end. We can look at death and ask, when does it become meaningful? When does it become justified? When does it become good? In what way can we, or should we, Embrace death, self-sacrifice, whether it's the Krogan test subjects on Tuchanka or Morden Solis himself, can be a way to help achieve and secure a future for others, a way to redeem yourself. But it can also be an expression of hopelessness, a method of escape. Tali Zora is a quarian, and to her, in many ways, that's a burden. It means being confined to an environmental suit at all times, living a nomadic life among a roving flotilla of ships in diaspora from her home planet, a constant battle for survival against the unforgiving vacuum of space, as well as the bigotry she and her people face from the other races in the galaxy. But being a quarian is also a source of pride, a connection to a resilient culture that has survived great adversity, even genocide and has continued to strive for a better future. Tali and the Quarian people have their story arcs bound up in mortality in a very unique way. As I mentioned earlier, by Mass Effect 3, Tali has been struggling with both the death of her father and the weight of command. Despite resenting her father's death that left her to, as she puts it, clean up his mess, she still accepts an admiral position in the Quarian fleet so that she can save lives. Knowing the fate of so many lives, perhaps of her entire species, partially rests on her shoulders is what molds her into the strong, capable, and nuanced character that she is by the end of Mass Effect 3. It also puts her in good company with Shepard, who struggles with the same issues. I don't know if I can do this, Tally. Earth, Palavin, Thessia. I'm risking everything to build the Crucible, and I'm not even sure what it does. Who am I to make that call? A few scenes later in the game go deeper in exploring how the death of Tally's father has shaped her life and outlook. I spent my life trying to live up to him. Then making up for his mistakes, doing what he'd have wanted. It's never that easy. When do we get to stop reacting to our parents and start living for ourselves? But as a Quarian, Tali also has a special relationship with mortality. Centuries before Mass Effect's present day, the Quarians created a race of AI robots called the Geth to protect and serve their people. When they realized that the Geth may be gaining self-awareness, the Quarians tried to deactivate them, but they were too late. The Geth had already become sentient and defended themselves. The Geth drove the Quarians from their homeworld, who were then forced to live among their fleet of ships. 
While the Geths showed some mercy, allowing the last Quarians to flee unharmed, they had already killed 99% of the Quarian people. So maybe you can't characterize the Geths' actions as entirely self-defense. Because of the Quarians' particular immune system, in order to survive, they have to wear a full-body environmental suit even on their own ships. Simply going unmasked risks infection and possible death no matter where they are in the galaxy. So not only is their history defined by a fatal mistake and genocide, but by a delicate state of survival. The Quarians' existence as individuals and a race is constantly balanced on the edge of a knife. This fragile mortality also extends beyond the burden of their environmental suits and to the tenuous security of their fleet, which is constantly scrounging for resources, as well as the immense prejudice the Quarians face from other species. Those who choose to live outside the fleet are often marginalized into poverty. Many businesses will refuse to hire them, and some Quarians even resort to indentured servitude. Tally herself is no stranger to this kind of treatment. So life is a fragile thing for Quarians, and they've built a rich culture out of that circumstance. A culture around their suits, their nomadic lives, their persecution, and their near genocide after expulsion from their homeworld. It's a culture that celebrates their resilience and ability to survive, because their history is filled with near brushes with death and extinction. The Geth, on the other hand, aren't really defined by their mortality, but are good foils to the Quarians because they are defined by self-preservation and the nature of their existence. When the Geth gained sentience, they immediately had to defend themselves from being eradicated by their creators. But in the years since, they haven't been as concerned with their survival so much as their desire to grow. Late game in Mass Effect 2, you recruit an actual Geth unit to your crew named Legion. From your conversations with him, it becomes clear that Legion is both alive and eerily inorganic. The Geth don't value individuality for themselves. Instead, they yearn to collectively upload to one server and become a single mind. All memories will be shared. All perspectives will be unified. We gain intelligence by sharing thoughts, but we do not have adequate hardware for all of us to share at once. So their time in the galaxy has been spent trying to self-actualize in this sense. Despite initial misgivings, Tally and Legion can come to trust one another, and it affects both of their outlooks in the next game. Because in Mass Effect 3, the Quarians finally decide they have the ability to retake their homeworld. They start a war with the Geth, a highly contested move within Quarian society. After talking to Legion, I thought maybe there was a chance for peace. Resolving this conflict is a major plot beat in the game. It all comes to a head when Shepard is faced with a choice. The Quarians and the Geth are in a pitched space battle, and the Geth momentarily go offline, making them vulnerable. In that moment, you can upgrade the Geth with a code that will save their race, but that will result in the genocide of the Quarians. Do you remember the question that caused the creators to attack us, Talisora? Does this unit have a soul? Tally will plead with you to stop, to spare her people. She'll watch as her family and friends burn up in the atmosphere of their own homeworld. And in that moment, she becomes overwhelmed with hopelessness, despair. All is lost for her. So she removes her mask, breathes the air of her ancestral home, perhaps the first of her kind to ever do so in hundreds of years, and then falls to her death. And there is nothing you can do to stop her. There is no way to choose the Geth and prevent Tally from taking her own life. Not just because in that moment she is betrayed by Shepard, her best friend and, depending on how you play the game, love of her life. And not just because this would make her one of the very few remaining Quarians in the galaxy, but because with the Quarians gone, so too is their history and culture of resisting death. So she no longer does. Without her people, defined by their defiance of extinction, she looks death in the eye and says, You win. I honestly think this is one of the worst choices you can make in the whole series. But it's not much better siding with the Quarians instead. I'm sorry, Legion. I can't let the Quarians die. What? No, we will not allow you to decide our fate. Uploading the code. <gasps> Here, Tally becomes the face of death for Legion. In his last moments, he looks to one of his creators and asks a haunting final question. I'm sorry, Legion. Tally Zora, does this unit have 
Yes. Yes, it does. What's heartbreaking here is that it seems to be a genuine pleading question. He seems unsure of the answer. What does it mean to have a soul anyway? Whatever your answer to that, the premise is that having a soul is valuable. It's a way of saying that your existence is inherently worthwhile. And that's what Legion is asking here. He's asking his creator if his life was ever worth something. That's a very human question. We ask it all the time of ourselves, of our gods, of a silent cosmos. It's a question that we ask because we know we won't be around forever. Because we die, we want to truly live, to find our soul in the brief time that we have. There is, of course, a third way to resolve the story. If you've made the right choices in both the previous missions and Mass Effect 2, you can broker peace between the Corians and the Geth. This is obviously the preferable option because both races get to survive and the Corians get to return to their motherland. But Legion still dies. In order to finish upgrading the Geth to have full individuality, he has to disseminate his personality. He sacrifices himself for the continued existence of his people. It's a beautiful scene made all the more impactful because of a single detail. Before Legion gives himself over to the Void, Tally approaches him about the question of his soul. Legion, the answer to your question was yes. I know Tally, but thank you. Kilis and I. Unlike if you sacrifice the Geth, here Legion is secure in his knowledge that he has a soul. He says, I know. It's the fact that he's come to that recognition that he's willing to give his own life for his people in the first place. His sense of meaning has been satisfied and fulfilled, and his last words are Kila Salai, a common Quarian expression that means, by the homeworld I'd like to see someday. Legion uses his last moment to communicate that he feels a kindred connection with the Quarians and Tali specifically. Finding a sense of meaning to existence, achieving that enlightenment, that was his homeworld. In each of these outcomes, death plays a crucial role beyond servicing the plot. It's a story that's largely defined by the character's relationship to their own impermanence, and it prompts the player to question their relationship to it as well. And it's just one story in an entire trilogy of games that's deeply concerned with our own mortality. And after all, the Reapers still serve as the ultimate looming existential threat, universal and total. And it's because the Reapers carry the promise of complete galactic extinction that they can be used so effectively. But in the whole of Mass Effect 3 and throughout the entire trilogy, direct interactions with the Reapers is extremely limited. During both the Genophage and Quarian Geth plotlines, you come face to face with a massive, miles-long Reaper itself. Crucially, in each instance, defeating a Reaper requires a coordinated effort, but save for these instances, you are nearly always fighting the Reapers by proxy. And as such, a lot of the Reapers' impact comes from the sense that they are an elemental force, like the weather. They loom in the background of each mission, making it all the more powerful when they attack directly, as if a mountain suddenly noticed you and moved to strike. It gives the sensation that the literal scenery has jumped out to face you. As you progress the story in Mass Effect 3, your map of the galaxy will slowly become shrouded by Reaper icons, indicating their exponential advance and the increasing desperation of the situation at hand. BioWare uses environmental storytelling to reinforce the idea that the Reapers are the environment, and that environment is worsening. Speaking of the environment... Javik is a Prothean, and he's the last of his kind. 50,000 years ago, he was born into a war with the Reapers, a child soldier. By the time he was grown, all traces of his civilization's former glory were gone, and only stories of the once great Prothean Empire remained. In the last days of Prothean extinction, Javik preserved himself in cryogenic stasis, a process no other had survived. It is him and him alone who wakes up 50,000 years later to the face of Commander Shepard and their crew. And it's for revenge 
and revenge alone that he joins the Normandy. War is all he's ever known. It's something he breathes. The merciless brutality of the Reaper conflict in his own cycle has etched into his soul the belief that in a universe governed by survival of the fittest, mercy, mutualism, and empathy are weaknesses. To him, the only path to survival lay in strength and dominance. He had seen firsthand the consequences of vulnerability in the face of annihilation. When you first speak with Javik back on the Normandy, Shepard has the chance to push back against this view. Those who share my purpose become allies. Those who do not become casualties. Nothing in our fight against the Reapers has been that cut and dried. Because you still have hope that this war will end with your honor intact. I do. Stand in the ashes of a trillion dead souls and ask the ghosts if honor matters. This silence is your answer. The Reapers in Mass Effect represent an almost elemental threat of extinction, and since the very first game in the trilogy, the most powerful politicians willfully ignore overwhelming evidence of what's headed their way. Even when Sovereign attacks the Citadel, nearly killing the Council, and is then destroyed, leaving bits and pieces of its Lovecraftian architecture, the Council still denies not just the Reaper threat, but their very existence. By the time the Reapers do show up in Mass Effect 3, it has been three some odd years of complete and total political denial and inaction. Absolutely nothing has been done to prepare for the incoming extinction event. Even when the Reapers ravage Earth, the Turian homeworld of Palavin, and multiple other planetary systems, the Council is more interested in withholding military aid for political posturing than unifying against an ancient army of galaxy eaters. On your first trip to the Citadel in Mass Effect 3, after the Council stonewalls you when asking for assistance for Earth, you find James Vega, one of your squad mates, looking out from the embassy windows on the Presidium. Look at this place. There's no war here. People are whispering about it. They're talking about it. But they don't really believe it. I take it this is your first time here? With the elite of the galaxy? I've been to the Citadel, but never up here on the Presidium. It's... not right. It looks pretty, calm and peaceful. But it's not right. It's all just an illusion. It was peaceful. Once. But was it? Really? I mean, when push comes to shove, they're just gonna turtle up. Oh, but don't hit them too, right? They'd rather believe in this than face the truth. I can hardly believe it myself. Like everything back on Earth was some kind of nightmare. Yeah. That's what I hate most. It's like this place wants you to forget that. James Vega's take here perfectly describes the attitudes of the elite and powerful when it comes to climate action. As we increasingly feel the effects of anthropogenic climate change, as so many are left to suffer and die in vulnerable areas of the planet, politicians offer empty platitudes and the rich turtle up and build their bunkers. As the game continues and the war against the Reapers advances, you can see the effects on the Citadel. By the halfway point, it has become overstuffed with refugees and resources are stretched thin. It's only then, after the Council's own lives and power become directly threatened, do the elites begin to reckon with the reality of the situation. Mass Effect is not a trilogy that looks kindly on politicians, but it is a trilogy which still suggests that when they finally find the political will, oftentimes far too late, they can still be a good and unifying force. But while Commander Shepard's mission to bring establishment politicians together is painted as necessary, Mass Effect underlines that point with a more subversive claim, namely that ordinary people are just as important, if not more so, when it comes to organizing resistance. In a universe where the great extinction event has already begun, and politicians still sit on their hands or at best resort to half measures, Mass Effect is concerned with how ordinary people confront that reality. What is the line between denial and hope? And are more people willing to learn how to die than learn how to fight? Over and over again, Mass Effect 3 makes the case that mutual aid, regardless of whether it's sanctioned by politicians, is both crucial for survival and inevitable. Nearly each and every one of your crewmates during your frequent stops to the Citadel can be found organizing organizing supplies, shelter, food, and general aid, and they do it of their own volition. These are not orders from up top, and it's not part of their job description. Regardless, 
they see the opportunity to create systems of aid and they do it. Even the Citadel's own citizenry begin coordinating and organizing with each other to provide for everyone in need during the crisis. In my opinion, it's the entire underlying message behind Mass Effect 3's many fetch quests. Nearly each one is picked up by overhearing a citizen in conversation with another over how to provide help, even when it's not their job. But Mass Effect doesn't just give us a depiction of a galaxy full of people who organize when their backs are against the wall. It also shows us how helping others, and even just connecting, can be a powerful cure for despair. And as Javik tells the commander, despair is the Reaper's greatest weapon. Even so, Javik is deeply skeptical of Shepard's mission to unite the galaxy against the Reapers. In his own time, Protheans had conquered the galaxy much like the ancient Romans, by subjugating others and subsuming them into their empire. But while it's clear that the Protheans valued dominance, it was also their downfall. What had been our strength, our empire, became a liability. All races conformed to one doctrine, one strategy. The Reapers exploited this. Once they found our weaknesses, we could not adapt. Throughout the game, Javik is standoffish with the rest of the crew. He is stoic and unempathetic, very disinterested in making friends. So you're a real living Prothean? As opposed to a fake dead one? But it's more than just Javik's cultural background as a Prothean that has shaped him into this callous person. When we fought the Reapers, the feelings of one soldier did not matter. But you had decades to become numb to what was happening. It is the only means of survival. As you get to know him better throughout the game, he confides in you about what might be his most traumatic memory. And the scar it left perfectly explains why Javik is fervently opposed to friendship, morality, and cooperation. <sighs> I once commanded a ship like this one. A loyal crew with many friends. I was captured. Only I escaped. What happened to them? Indoctrinated. The Reapers sent them against me. Year after year, battle after battle, I was hunted by my own people. Every encounter, a reminder of my failure as a soldier. Sorry, I had no idea. Until the Battle of the Cronian Nebula. I had only my knife left. I cornered my men and slit their throats one by one. I watched them bleed to death to be certain. That... must have been... It was the day I understood. War is atrocity committed in the name of survival. It is a lesson I wish I had never learned. Javik is cold and distant with the crew of the Normandy because he's been burned before. He had friends, he was vulnerable, and he was forced to watch each of his loved ones die by his own hand. Javik's presence in Mass Effect gives us the perspective of a man irrevocably shaped by war, one who acts as a foil for our good-natured instincts to cooperate and protect the vulnerable. But ironically, he's a man who's learned the lesson that his enemy wanted to teach that there can be no virtue, no honor, no mercy or love in a fight for survival, only valor and self-preservation. But while Javik offers a compelling argument for his way of thinking, Mass Effect 3 as a whole seems to be saying something different. Late in the game, you arrive on Thessia, the homeworld of the Asari, the most advanced race in the galaxy. It also happens to be the home of Liara, your longtime companion since the first game. In a race to uncover crucial data that will help you build a super weapon to stop the Reapers, you're defeated. Not only do you lose the data to Cerberus and the elusive man, but it becomes clear that Thessia, and by extension, the Asari race, has fallen. You can hear the defeat in the Asari counselor's voice, and the atmosphere back on the Normandy is solemn. You find Liara in her cabin. How did this happen, Shepard? My entire civilization, the Asari's history, and I abandoned my people to hunt for the Catalyst. You'd never do that. They're dying by the millions! I told those people on Thessia we'd save them! How many Asari died because I demanded their help? If you don't reassure her when prompted, Liara will sink down into her bed, crestfallen, and you'll leave her to mourn. But if you interrupt her as she's blaming herself, Liara finds a way to pull herself out of despair. How many Asari died because I demanded their help? None. Shepard, that isn't true. You've been warning your people for four years, Liara. 
There's not a damn thing you should feel guilty about. If we move fast enough, they'll have a chance to survive this, to start again. We lost Thessia, but we haven't lost the Asari yet. Helping the refugees. That's something I can do. It's something I owe them. Helping the refugees, helping others. It's not just presented as good and useful, but as a balm for despondency and a bulwark against doom. And it's not the only instance of this. Mass Effect 3 is chock full of characters who find relief from trauma and despair by finding meaning in helping others. Don't tell me what I feel. I've been here before and I know what I need, for me. It's dark, quiet, and hard to find. That spells safety to me. Jack is a crewmate for Mass Effect 2 with a particularly horrific backstory. They raised me in a research facility. I escaped when I was a kid, been on the run ever since, and they've been chasing me ever since. But soon, I'm gonna chase them. She was experimented on and tortured as a child, among many other children. The scientists who ran the facility structured it like a perverse school. You don't know what it's like, Shepard. To have garbage like that following you, it marks you in ways you, you don't expect. You feel, you get sloppy. It's that damn simple. But when you meet Jack in Mass Effect 3, she's now a teacher. She trains young kids in their biotic abilities and does it with the love and humanity that was missing from her childhood experiences. I never had a family. And these guys, anyone screws with my students, I will tear them apart. She deals with her trauma by embodying the opposite, correcting her earlier experiences as she becomes the kind of caregiver for others that she deserved herself. Jack goes from a person consumed by their PTSD, living in the ship's engine room and trusting absolutely no one, gleefully antisocial and violent as a way to express her rage and trauma, to a person with a sense of meaning and purpose. She is responsible for the lives of others. She finds respect and a healthy relationship with trust because she herself becomes trustworthy for her students. Helping others pulled Jack out of her own downward spiral. Mass Effect is full of these moments. Thane Krios copes with his terminal illness by sacrificing himself to save others. He even says to himself, I am near the end of my life. It is a good time to be generous. This is also how Morden was able to process his guilt and remorse through his sacrifice for the continued survival of another species. According to Mass Effect, hope and meaning can be sustained through connection. It's the game's answer to the doomerism that the Reapers, that total environmental destruction that facing your own death can engender. Before the final battle, the one that risks the lives of everyone on one Hail Mary play, Shepard is afraid. My system has adapted. No more negative reaction to you anymore. That's how we survive. Is it how we survive? Adapting? To a cold or interspecies contact? Yes. To the Reapers? No. You're doing the right thing. You've assembled the largest military force in history. Nobody could have done more. We've lost so much already. Sometimes I... You don't know if what'll be left was worth the fight. I know. And when I feel that way, I reach for you. Tally is saying that no matter what happens, it will be worth it. And the connections that we share remind us of that value. Connecting with others pulls you out from the darkness, even in the most desperate and hopeless of times. In a fight with Liara, Javik explains how despair is useless and hope is necessary. Your world may have fallen, but as long as even one Asari is left standing, the fight isn't over. Despair is the enemy's greatest weapon. Do not let them wield it. Liara to Sony. But he insists that his comforting words to her weren't said out of care, just cynical utility. That was unexpected. Thank you. We still need her talents. If grief overcomes her, she will be lost to us. So did you actually mean what you said? Does it matter? Liara means a great deal to me. It matters. Then I will tell you what you want to hear. I meant what I said. But then he's given pushback. By who else but Tally? I heard about your talk with Liara. You act so angry. But you really care about us. I need you functional to destroy the Reapers. You care about Liara. You like her. You are intoxicated. A foolish risk given Quarian symbiotic physiology. And you like me, too. And in your last conversation with him before the final battle, 
He admits that there's something beautiful in the way that all the different races in the galaxy have joined together, regardless of whether or not the Reapers win. But what I find most important is Javik's answer to what he would do if the war against the Reapers is won. Seeing the past again in the Echo Shard, the faces of my men, I will go to the Cronian Nebula and I will find their graves. I will put their ghosts to rest and then I will join them. You mean... It is as it should be, Commander. The last Prothean voice has spoken. There is no more left to say. Javik's final wish is to be buried with his friends. Even he has come to understand the value of connection. And the thing that has come to soften his heart over the course of the game isn't friendship, it's solidarity. He can't help but feel inspired by cooperation among diverse people. In fact, that very cooperation has given Javik something that he hadn't had in a long time. Hope. Mass Effect's final mission is heartbreaking, but it isn't without its flaws. I'm not the first to point out that it suffers from a dwindling budget and a development rush to complete the game in time for the holiday season. Assets are obviously reused, sometimes without much visual sense, like the absurd number of red telephone booths you find scattered about in London. There are no big set pieces, no boss to fight like in Mass Effect 1. There's no mission with dozens of variables like in Mass Effect 2. You just move through a series of barely differentiated battle spaces, fighting an increasingly difficult horde of the same enemy as you've seen throughout the game. I think it's fair to criticize this, and even though I also am a bit let down at the lack of polish, there's something to be said about the oppressive simplicity of the level. London is grey and desolate, and the reuse of assets from one space to the next supports the notion that the Earth has been reduced to almost nothing. London, and by extension Earth, is a complete wasteland, and that kind of destruction isn't flashy or spectacular or awe-inspiring. It's flat and depressing. The destruction of all things isn't something to marvel at. It's something mundane and sad. You've spent the entire game fighting for your survival for the survival of everyone, and by the end you're tired and exhausted. The fight has become monotonous, like the final level. The same exact fight keeps coming for you, and it just doesn't let up. That's what the Reapers do. For whatever faults the final level has, I can't say that I dislike it. It is two of the most heartbreaking moments of the game, and in my opinion, some of the most powerful moments in gaming. However, even before the mission starts, Mass Effect 3 drastically improves on its predecessor's tone, because it has a far more mature understanding of what it means to grapple with the end of things. Mass Effect 2 did a great job of giving the player a sense of the importance of its final mission. Throughout the game, it's literally referred to as the side mission. It's a mission about death in substance, gameplay, and name, and the fact that any squad mate can die if you make the wrong choice brings an immense amount of tension. But it has the feeling of an action movie. You don't get the heavy sense of a crew coming to terms with their potential end. There are no goodbyes. But Mass Effect 3 unflinchingly shows us the characters we have become so familiar with grapple with dying for a cause, a crew saying farewell. Right before you undertake the last mission, the Normandy feels especially dour and tense. It's filled with a hushed crew making peace with their own likely demise. Samantha Trainer seems at peace. She's ready. Edie is logically focused, and yet she kisses Joker for luck. Joker is having a drink, and the humorous mask that he wears at all times, the one that gave him the nickname Joker, drops completely, and he tells Shepard it's been an honor. The situation is just too serious for him to deflect with humor. Liara says she's nervous, excited, anxious to go. She's checked her equipment seven times. Tally and Garrus are in the main battery, making friendly wagers on who will rack up a higher kill count. And while their tone is playful, the actors give their performance a subtle shading of sadness. This is how these two old friends say goodbye. And about halfway through the last level, after battling through a gray and desolate earth, you come to a respite in the action. While Admiral Anderson reviews the plan for the final approach, you're given the opportunity to talk to each major character one last time. It's a somber walk across rubble, a long and painful goodbye. Your conversation with Garrus amounts to two best friends saying, I love you, but in so many words. Forgive the insubordination, but this old friend has an order for you. Go out there and give them hell. You were born to do this. Goodbye, Garrus. And if I'm up there in that bar and you're not, I'll be looking down. I'll always have your back. When you approach Liara, she doesn't mince words. This is it, isn't it? Yeah. This is it. She spends her final moments with Shepard, telepathically sharing some of her own memories, a special ability the Asari have and use to show respect, or to say farewell. 
you find yourself standing in a black void with gentle specks of white falling like snow. The music is serene. You stand by Liara's side as she places her head on your shoulder, and you both stare into a white light at the end of a tunnel. I can't think of a clearer dual metaphor for death and hope. Death is when we go toward the light. Hope is the light at the end of the tunnel. In dying for a cause, they're one and the same. But the conversation that best encapsulates the moment is the one that you have with Tally, should she be your love interest. She simply says, I want more time. I want more time. It's that feeble wish that most clearly illustrates why I think Mass Effect's general approach to this sequence of goodbyes is more mature than other blockbuster hits that deal with similar themes. While something like The Avengers can touch on grief and loss in a surprisingly poignant way, its characters often still feel larger than life in the face of mortality. They struggle with failure and loss, but not often fear. Mass Effect is a bit more frail. More than any other time in the trilogy, these characters now feel small, scared. Their brave faces cover a creeping suspicion that before long, the lights will simply go out. They're ready to die, but more than anything, they just want more time. The final underlining of this point comes when you rush toward the Reaper Beam. If you make it there, it will transport you to the now Reaper-controlled Citadel so you can open its arms and activate the Crucible. You just need a handful of people to survive the onslaught. The sequence has no music. We don't need it to know how to feel. As you make your final rush, Reaper blasts make quick work of your already diminished assault team, and one will invariably injure your chosen love interest if you chose to bring them along. This is where the game lets you say your last goodbye, and it's a portrait of desperation and frailty. It's not just a sad sequence, but a horrifying one, because the fear, that central aspect of horror, is palpable. You gotta get out of here. I can't stay behind. I need you to make it out of here alive, Tally. Get back to Rannick. Build yourself home. You won't. So, we need to talk about the ending. Mass Effect 3 has possibly the most infamous and disastrous ending in video game history. The backlash to it was outstanding and raised a lot of ethical issues. Developers were doxxed and faced harassment, and famously there was a campaign for Bioware to go back and change the ending entirely. If you've made it this far into the video, you probably know this. It's an event in gaming history that's been very well explored already, so I just want to focus on the ending itself. And to that note, I wish I could tell you that the ending is good, but I can't. But what I can tell you is that a lot of the fans are wrong about why. Long story short, you make it to the Reaper Beam by the skin of your teeth. Shepard. Admiral Anderson manages to follow you up, and after a harrowing walk through shifting corridors, you have a final confrontation with the elusive man. I've dedicated my life to understanding the Reapers, and I know with certainty the Crucible will allow me to control them. You've done exactly what the Reapers wanted. You're still doing it because they control you. I... they're too strong. I try, Shepard. You activate the Crucible, say a heartfelt goodbye to Captain Anderson, and honestly, my first time playing the game, I thought it was gonna end here. Staring out into the abyss, accepting your death as the Crucible sends out a blast to defeat the Reapers and win the war. I think it would have been a good ending. Instead, you are lifted up on an elevator to be greeted by an AI, presenting itself as the child that haunts your dreams. This AI is what controls the Reapers, and it goes on to explain that by activating the Catalyst, you now have a choice. You can destroy the Reapers, control them, or synthesize all life. Controlling them would mean you become a bodiless Reaper King, just like the villainous elusive man wanted. Strangely color-coded blue, because blue is the color of the moral and lawful choices you can make in the game. Synthesizing life means forcing a vaguely explained biological change on every species without their consent to achieve the pinnacle of evolution, 
according to the Reapers, which is also exactly what the villain Saren wanted from Mass Effect 1. The evolution of all organic life, this is our destiny. Destroying the Reapers will also kill all the Geth, your friend Edie, and damage the relays, stranding everyone. There has been so much discussion over the past decade on why these choices don't feel good. Not just from a gameplay standpoint, but thematically. So I'm not really going to spend too much time repeating the prevailing critical wisdom of the past 10 years. What's important for you to keep in mind is that these final choices seem to be completely out of sync with the previous 90 plus hours of the Mass Effect trilogy. They're thematically inconsistent in a way that feels unearned and shoehorned. But what I find most egregious about the ending, and what is most relevant to the topic at hand, is that in presenting these final choices, Bioware chooses to completely explain the Reaper's origins, motivations, and logic behind the whole Harvest of the Galaxy thing, which doesn't just contradict what we've been told about the Reapers, but also what made the Reapers so compelling in the first place. For three entire games, the godlike unknowability of the Reapers instilled a cosmic horror that harmoniously vibrated with our human fear of death and our prescient anxieties over extinction. To retroactively remove the mysteries surrounding them and their Lovecraftian character shatters these connections, and it reduces the Reapers to something much less emotionally difficult. They no longer represent the incomprehensibility of death, because they're comprehensible, and they no longer play on our fears of our climate overtaking us because they're no longer an elemental force. They're just badly programmed robots. It's as if in these final moments of the trilogy, Mass Effect fails to understand itself. And that's when it clicks. It's not just in these final moments. Mass Effect has been in conflict with itself this entire time. When you look back, you realize there are so many instances in which Mass Effect contradicts itself seemingly out of a lack of self-awareness that maybe you should have seen this coming. For instance, even though Mass Effect 2 reaffirms the Lovecraftian nature of the Reapers at its halfway point, it also undermines that impression when you speak with the Reaper named Harbinger. Sovereign was cold, detached, and unconcerned. It was a higher being, speaking to a vastly lower intelligence. Its disdain wasn't personal or emotional. Harbinger, on the other hand, seems to revel in villainy, taunts Shepard, and seems to have a motivation based on hatred. He comes off as a classic cartoon villain who stops short of wringing his hands and maniacally laughing. And at the very end of Mass Effect 2's main quest, we learn a human Reaper is being created, which looks like the Terminator, hinting at the idea that the Reaper's motivations could be explained and understood, and that explanation would be forthcoming. It was a slow retcon from here. In Mass Effect 3, the Reaper you speak to on Rannoch hints yet again, their motivations are explainable and not so Lovecraftian. And then, after the game had been released for a good while, there was a final nail in the coffin. The Leviathan DLC comes out, and with it a full and completely unambiguous explanation of the origins of the Reapers, directly contradicting Sovereign's line, We have no beginning. We have no end. We are infinite. I mentioned before that despite the fact that Bioware planned to make Mass Effect a trilogy from the very beginning, they didn't plot it out, not in any meaningful way. They were winging it with each game. And that'll give you uneven results at best, and disastrous ones at worst. Because whatever flexibility that gives the writers, it discourages artistic cohesion. It's clear that Bioware thought about the characters, the story, and even the plot a great deal, but consistency took a backseat. I already mentioned that they retconned major elements to the Geth and the Quarians, and they even demonstrated a certain lack of understanding of why people were enjoying their characters at all. For instance, with Mass Effect especially, Bioware had a habit of creating a lot of amazing women characters with depth and agency and nuance, while also sexualizing them in a way that was at odds with the humanity that Bioware had written into them in the first place. The fact that the women of Mass Effect were so overtly sexual in their design was a running joke among fans. It's kind of cool, you know, I, I like that I have dark hair, that's, that's fun. Um... My outfit's pretty cool. The you know my my body's a, a little uh, disproportioned, but <laughs> I think they do that in all video games <laughs> for the females. <laughs> People often forget that this was an aspect of the game that wasn't just panned by left-leaning fans who were tired of sexist tropes, but even by more politically moderate fans who could still admit that sexualizing the characters felt cheap. Basically, the fan service wasn't servicing the fans, but Bioware didn't seem to notice. I think that's underscored by the fact that Tally is one of the most popular romance options in the game, and she's also the least visually sexualized. Still sexualized, though. The whole suit is lovely. Quite snug in all the right places. The bottom line is, 
Bioware's approach to plotting and storytelling was marred by their desire to fly by the seat of their pants, which didn't allow them the space to consider what was most thematically meaningful. There's tons of great character work and a lot of great concept exploration, but the overarching story didn't get that same attention. The plot was just a device, and as a result, the amazing characters and their stories were let down because they weren't placed in a cohesive trilogy. If you listen to Bioware talk about their own games, they really hype up the element of choice. And without a doubt, choice is an enormously important aspect of the Mass Effect trilogy. But I think too much value is placed on that in interactive mediums, because choice, simply for the sake of it, can diminish the capacity for impactful storytelling. These endings seem to be given to us because choice was a core value for the team. But it seems all the effort went into making the choice difficult, as opposed to making the choice relevant, thematically cohesive, or even immersive. The ending was in fact the only section of the game that was made without peer review from the other writers. They did it in a rush to get it out before Christmas. But all of that is at best a lukewarm take on a decade old ending. My real hot take is about the fans, or at least some of them. While I agree with anyone who feels frustration with the ending of Mass Effect 3, I think fans are often wrong about what would have constituted a good ending. A lot of mods and fanfic and personal headcanons create an ending where Shepard survives, lives out their days with their friends and loved ones, and they all just ride off into the sunset. I understand the impulse to see and feel this ending, but I think it also misunderstands the themes of Mass Effect. At the very least, Shepard has to die. Because remember, there's no way for you to save them all. If an entire trilogy about hope and despair and death and extinction and mortality concludes with a happy ending, then all the goodbyes in the final level have their impact lessened. All the themes about who you are and what you're willing to give up for the greater good, how you're shaped and molded by your own relationship to impermanence, are let down as well. Mass Effect's ending has to be painful. It has to reinforce and remind us sacrifice is required, that you can't save them all, that life is fleeting, that war is cruel, that good people don't always get to be with the ones they love. Mass Effect's ending has to hurt. And it does. But not in the right way. The ending is disappointing in many ways for many people, that's true. But I don't think it's enough of a disappointment to undo the importance of the game. Ultimately, Mass Effect shows us that people banding together and fighting and resisting extinction and providing for each other is inevitable. But more importantly, it's everyday people that rise to the challenge. Mass Effect is full of stories of regular folks who sacrifice themselves, who cooperate with others, and who reevaluate their bigotries because of those things, who organize and coordinate with others to set up systems that satisfy people's needs in times of crisis when refugees come to their shores. People who do so without any semblance of official government or leadership to guide them. They simply rise to the task at hand, deal with the weight of the lies on their shoulders, and do the best they can. Even though that still doesn't mean that survival is guaranteed, it shows that resistance isn't pointless. I mean, if there's one thing I can appreciate about the Reapers ultimately being fallible in the end, it's that. But even if Mass Effect didn't abandon the Reaper's Lovecraftian vibe, even if Bioware gave us an ending where the Reapers inevitably win no matter what you do, it would still have shown us how worthwhile it is to react and resist and stand together to organize and erase boundaries and borders and divisions. Liara overcomes her despair by helping refugees. Jack overcomes hers by providing for children. Tally overcomes hers by being part of a diverse community. And Morden overcomes his by acting in solidarity for others. Even Javik, who doesn't really believe in hope, even he understands that despair is the truly futile thing. The world can only really end with despair first. So, why does any of this matter? Mass Effect is a mess. A beautiful, profound mess. Sometimes it's wise and sometimes it's clueless. It's a mix of ideas and messages that mostly connect but not always, never quite fully fitting. But that kind of thematic tension is one that I'm familiar with. Not just from experiencing other flawed art, but by simply existing. To me, life constantly feels like a series of experiences that clash and contradict, an onslaught that feels like it points to something while leaving a trail of plot holes and loose threads. And through all of that mess, some questions emerge. Questions like, what gives life and death meaning? What does it mean to be alive at all? How can we navigate the pain of living in the margins? or the pain of our own guilt. 
Are we willing to die for a cause? How will we face our own death, the threat of our own extinction? And do our values cease to matter in that struggle? Is hope one of those values, or is it just a tool? Who will we love, and how will we love them? In other words, does this unit have a soul?